for me, when I'm swimming really well, I almost feel like I'm swimming at like, you know, kind of like a metronome. So it's like up, up, down, up, up, down. Welcome back to the Social Kick Podcast. I'm Brian Lundquist. We got a full crew, Dr. John Mullen, Luke Paddington, and joining us remotely, Giles Smith. What's up, Giles? Hey, what's up, Brian? How are you doing today? Yeah, we're doing good. Uh, you know, we got away from doing this, but hey, you're you're an adult uh, on a late evening or late week evening. What are you drinking tonight? Uh, man, you know I'm in training. So um, <laughs> when I was a little when I was a little younger, you know, I really used to have some fun. But you know, now I'm a little older. I got to be so you know really particular what goes into my body. So you know, I'm just mm-hmm. keeping it basic. Just drink some water tonight. Yeah, I, I like that. I can appreciate that. Uh, Luke, what are you drinking tonight? I'm I'm starting off with an IPA, but I really fall in love this IPA here. But I really fall in love with the athletic brewery stuff too, which is a non-alcoholic stuff that's been hitting up. And honestly, if somebody told me this was a beer with alcohol, I wouldn't know the difference if it had alcohol or not. They're quite good, and they're four flavors. And tonight's this is going to be the golden ale, which is quite good. I don't know if I've had that one, but I really love the IPA from Athletic Brewing. And for sure, that's really taken over the alcohol consumption. Ninth, f- 50 calories, 0% mm-hmm. alcohol, tastes like a beer, placebo, I'm good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Green, Grievers pitches that, so, you know, it's, it's good stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, Grievers, he's, is a, Grievers is a lifetime homie. <laughs> <laughs> he's also still shredded, by the way, which big ups to him. Yeah, that's awesome. Man, he's, he's got those great genetics, man. He's got gladiator genetics, man. There's only so many Matt Grievers. <laughs> that's for sure. There's only, there's only one. Hey, we'll, we'll be sure to tell him it's all genetics. <laughs> uh, John, what are you drinking tonight? Uh, I'm just having water. I had my uh, second COVID vaccine uh, today, so I figured I'll play it safe, make sure no um, cold or flu-like symptoms come on from that, so keeping it healthy tonight. Great. Hell yeah. Vaccinated guy. I love it. So good. What are you right. what are you drinking? Yeah, I'll close this out. Uh, Kona Brewing. I got the multi-pack uh, the other day. I never had the – well, I just grabbed the Blonde Ale because it was the last one, but honestly, the Golden Ale I quite liked, and I hadn't had that before. Uh, their lager is okay. If I had to pick one, it's the golden ale, but I don't know, kind of different for me. I'm usually drinking IPAs or something. So yeah. yeah. Anyway, enough about that. Giles, what's going on with you? Where are you? Give us an update. Yeah. So I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, you know, training, getting ready for trials a little bit. Um, I work too. So, you know, I'm one of those few swimmers that, you know, kind of, you know, balances work and swim. So, um, it's, it's a good little thing that kind of just keeps my mind off of swimming, you know, like 24 seven. But um, no, it's been good. Got some good training in the past couple months and, um, you know, looking forward to I think I'm going to race in San Antonio in March. So Mm -hmm. should be good to get some long course swimming. in. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about that, too, because like that that is kind of a rare thing to be work working full time and trying to balance the the swim career. Pretty hard. Have you how long you been doing that? And has it been kind of a journey for you to figure out what the right balance is, how much you can give into that without taking away from your swimming? Yeah, no, most definitely. It's a balancing act. Um, I've done it in like, you know, little times and and spurts. So I um, have retired from swimming after 2016. And so after trials, I was like, nah, man, I'm done. I ain't never swimming again, ever. And (laughs) I was wrong. Um, You know, I got the itch when I was um, sitting at my desk at work and I looked at one of the um, Grand Prix results and I was just like, 53. Do that, right? (laughs) Changes that change. (laughs) And so I was just like, all right, so. I kind of like got the itch around January 2018 to be like, all right, maybe I can do this again. And so I, you know, started with obviously working and and just jumping back in slowly and surely. But I mean, it was a a for sure struggle up front, you know, Mm -hmm. after being out of water pretty much for a year and a half, two years. I mean, took a took a couple good sets of training to get back fit for, you know, you don't get back to swimming fitness very quickly. Were you, did you become a gym rat right after you retired and then you just got super yoked and spent all the time <laughs> doing it, lifting weights? <laughs> what were you doing in between? Um, I was lifting some weights and that was one thing that kind of, you know, kept me engaged and stuff. And um, I think it made it a little easier. So like probably after about a year, nine months, I started kind of getting really serious about the weight training again. And that kind of made it like fun. I was like, oh man, I'm like having fun lifting weights. And I was just ripping a bunch of 25s and stuff like that. And so I went to, um, I went to 2017 world champ trials, but like, I mean, I literally did no training and I was just doing 25s and lifting weights and it it went all right. I got like fifth, but 
you know, it was it was interesting to kind of see that, hey, you can do that and swim at like a pretty decent level. I knew I wasn't my, my best, but, you know, yeah. it's cool to just go there and just like rip a fifth. Yeah, totally. I actually had a similar experience. Um, after 2008 trials, I took uh, a semester abroad uh, and just took a few months off of swimming. I ended up turning my ankle pretty bad and I was living in Italy. And um, so I couldn't run. I couldn't do any cardio. I didn't have a pool, but I just lifted, you know, a couple times a week and I was still qualified for short course nationals. So I came back and went to nationals. I was fat. Everybody on deck was like, hey, man, you like you look ridiculous. I had like a belly hanging over my suit. But I, but I was at like 90% of my best times and I had only been in the water nine times before that, that meet. And I'm like, Oh, strength is the way. Especially in the fifties and stuff like that. Fifties and hundreds. Yeah. I mean, it, it's all power. The hundreds, you know, long course meters, hundreds, you gotta be fit. You know, you can't swim 48 seconds, 50 seconds, 46 seconds, however long it takes and, and not be fit. But you know, those fifties, it's, it's more about power and how you hold water. And, you know, being able to hold and maintain good stroke length, you know, I mean, I know, you know, how to swim a 50, you had American record for a little bit. So you kind of, you definitely know what it takes. Yeah. Um, I love how, I mean, we're finally starting to see this shift and acceptance of kind of like you're experiencing where you're working, you're training, it still can be done. It just takes a little bit for everyone to find their own rhythm of that balance. So maybe now talk us through, are you working 40 hours a week? Um, no. Okay, yeah, let's kind of get into that because you got some big things coming up with trials yeah. and all that. Yeah. So um I work so I'm working right now as a real estate agent and um uh-huh. we actually just closed the it was cool, just closed the property um yesterday, so that was sweet. Ooh, nice. Um got property under contract. Um so that's good it's a good start to the week. And um, but I probably put in maybe 20, 25 hours a week. It's not a true 40. And yeah. you know, with COVID and kind of the, the work from home you know, flow that goes on right now, it's um, it's kind of made it truthfully a little easier with balancing swimming. Like I've done it where I've been in an office for, you know, you go in four hours and then during your lunch break, you go swim and then you come back and you work more. I've done it that way. And that's really hard right now. It's, um, it's a little bit more balanced. I mean, I have moments like yesterday, like, I mean, I, I drove like an hour to go show a property and then drove an hour back to write the contract. And then I was late for practice, but I still did the full practice. It's just like, you have to balance and prioritize um, as it gets closer. And I know that, you know, once it's April, May, I mean, I'm probably going to, you know, take a, a probably a real break from even probably selling the houses just to just really focus on this. And I mean, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity I have left and, um, I just want some of my best drops if, you know, everything happens, all the COVID, you know, that's mm. it. Jazz, how flexible is, has your swimming been to your work and obviously vice versa, your, your work style, you can adapt it to your swimming, but ha- have you and your coach considered flexible swimming schedules to match what you need for your work? Like my brother quit swimming ultimately because he just couldn't work a nine to five and train at 4 a.m. and in the evenings. He was, yeah. the two didn't shift. And I hated that. And I, I hope that both would give. Have you and your coach talked about being flexible to help support you and support, you know, in your racing? Yeah. I mean, we look at it like a little bit differently. I mean, I'm not, you know, 19 or 18 anymore. So do I need 10 practices in the water? Really? Probably not. But I'm in the water it's like seven, eight times a week. And I'm lifting two, three times a week as well. Yeah. It's just um you know, those days where I'm like so beat up or so tired or so stressed out with work, we might back down practice a little bit. But for the most part, I don't, you know, have days where I'm really struggling just with balancing it. But I do have days. I mean, I've had days where I've been, you know, walking a bunch and running here, running there. And I get to the pool like all frantic and you yeah. know, coach just like, hey, man, just do like easy 2000. And so, it, you know, it, it's just balanced. Yeah. You know, you're stressed out about closing a deal or something and you're not in the practice. <laughs> yeah. But it goes the other way too, like you were kind of alluding yeah. to. Do you like look at people on international trips or national team and you're like, man, this person needs like a part-time job or something. They just need like something to give their brain something else to focus on instead of just swim, 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 yeah. swim. I think for some people, um, it depends on the person, you know, person. Yeah. And I don't want to talk for anybody, but I think for some people it would definitely help just because, you know, it may it gets you to put things in perspective. You know, swimming is huge. Don't get me wrong. I love swimming. I love swimming fast. Who doesn't love winning medals and doing all that cool stuff? But at the same time, it's not everything, mm-hmm. you know. And I think it's good to have that sense of balance and just, like, know who you are and things like that. I mean, when I was younger, 
I would definitely say that like I fully identified as a swimmer where now it's, you know, it's a lot different. I feel like I'm, I'm Giles, the person who swims where before it was just like, you know, a swimmer. And that's all I felt like I could do when I was a little younger. That's such a DC Trident mindset, right? And you're the captain of DC Trident. Talk yeah. to me about, uh, did you have to, your role as a captain, that was a huge part of the role, just try and get that harmony of, of being humans in, on the team for the last couple of years? Talk for sure. Uh, just trying to, you know, it's bigger than swimming and just trying to, you know, that if you swim fast, great. If you swim slow, great. As long as you're giving your best effort, you're consistent, you're supporting your teammates. I mean, that's all that really matters. When you go back and you retire, you're not going to remember, oh, I got out touched by two tenths of a second at this like specific meet. Like you're going to remember the memories with the people that you had and, um, you know, the places you got to go to, the place you got to travel to. Um, the, the relationships you build, that's what, you know, the sport's really about. Um, the medals, all that stuff, the winning, trust me, I like that stuff too. Don't get me wrong, but it's, it's, it's a lot that encompasses, you know, swimming. It's more than just, you know, swimming laps and, and winning. Cause no matter what, no matter who you are, you know, you're going to have moments where you're on top. You're going to have moments where you get kind of crushed in this sport. It's, it's just how it is. Well, Luke hasn't done a cheesy plug in a while. So would you say social kicks, the most important thing of swimming for you? <laughs> no doubt. You, know, you got to stretch those legs out, man. You got to stretch those legs out, get a little social time on the, um, on the board. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan of social kicking. <laughs> I don't think it's at all. <laughs> um, hey, uh, do you feel like you've, uh, with the different sort of mindset that you've had, especially, um, you know, having taken the break and then come back, um, do you feel like you've gotten a sense of uh, who this kind of, um, I don't know how to say it, like mature is not the right word, but um, maybe, maybe aware of what's important in life in a different way and what you value most and, and how you value yourself. Do you feel like, do you feel like you've seen how that represents in, in your races yet? Or is it still too new after your comeback to really get a sense of how that manifests all the way through your career? Not just how you approach training on a daily basis, but how you approach meets and also how that how that leads to the results that you have. Yeah, I think it's just, um, you know, Probably before I retired, I mean, I kind of looked at meets as like, that's where you got to, you know, you show out and you you do the best that you can at the meets. Obviously, you train hard, but, you know, I was always a swimmer that I felt like at the meets, I could take my swim into a, like a way higher level. Um, now, since coming back, um, truthfully, when I first came back, I couldn't swim worth nothing. I mean, I was dropping. I think my first meet back, I went like a 49, like 900 fly short course yards. That's slow. That's really slow, man. And so I was just like, I feel like, Sorry. I was like, so I'm going to come back and, and be like this rough. Maybe I should go back to the office job. <laughs> but um, it got better. You know, it, it, it's just like, um, it, it is kind of just like riding a bike. Um, if you've done the work over your career, mm -hmm. that work isn't going to really go away. If you kind of, you know, you get back on the bike and start, you know, doing the sets that you need to do to go fast. And uh, when it comes to just, you know, being a little older and having a little bit more experience, I think when it comes to everything now, I just appreciate things a lot more. Like I remember I would go on trips, like, you know, big national team trips, international trips. And I just be like, Oh yeah, like this is cool and all, but like, I wouldn't like really like take in all the, you know, the setting the travel, the people where like, you know, the last past two years of like ISL and doing a couple international meets, like, I'm just like really just sat back and just be like, damn, like I'm in Italy right now or I'm in Hungary or like this is really cool. And I'm just I'd say I'm grateful. That's the, the, the number one thing, as opposed to before where I, I felt like I was just doing this because I was good at it or I was just doing this because I had success at it. Where like, I mean, I'm doing this because I want to, I, you know, and um, I don't like need to swim. It's like I swim truly because I, I enjoy it and like I want to. I want to swim fast. Yeah, it sounds like you can kind of stop and smell the flowers with this perspective of, like you said, just being able to enjoy these amazing opportunities that, you know, your skill and your hard work is allowing you to afford. Yeah, for sure. That and I just look at it this way. Like, I mean, 
I'm in a position where I can give a lot of my time and effort back to kids. And like, I remember what it was like growing up um, as a kid. I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's, it's a lot different than, you know, Phoenix, Arizona and things like that. And, um, but the main thing I would say with just being able to help kids and regardless of, you know, what you look like, what color, creed, whatever, um, just like help them, you know, build their confidence and feel like they have somebody that like, you know, they can trust and somebody that listens to, listens to them and somebody that cares. I remember when I was that age and if, you know, a, a national level swimmer of like that level had spent the time to be like, hey, man, work on this, do this, do that. Mm -hmm. Like that would have made a real difference in my life. And, um, you know, I'm just trying to do that as much as I can for kids. You know, obviously, within the rules of safe sport, you know, obviously, you can keep everything normal. But, um, you know, I, I really try to help the kids. I mean, that that's where swimming has given me so much. That's where I give back. Mm -hmm. But, Giles, let's, let's dive into that then. It's Black History Month. Yeah. I study sport. I love the sport and I love the history. And I'm really passionate about having an inclusive sport. Give me some insight about the, um, about the, the black history of swimming um, that I don't know about. Yeah, well, I think that um, especially for me, I look back and think of all the people that came before me and people that are going to come after me. But one of the first ones I think of is Fred Evans. He was the first um, black national champion. He won 100 breaststroke um, back in the 70s. Um, Enith Brigida was the first. Um, she was the first person of color to win an Olympic medal in the Olympics. Um, I could think of Byron Davis, one of the best hundred butterflyers um, in the early in the late '90s and um, early 2000s. Um, Sabir Cullen has been obviously a huge role model for me. Um, someone that I've got to build a very close friendship, especially um, as I've gotten a little older. Um, Simone Leonel, uh, Marissa Karaya McClendon. Um, she made the Olympics team in 2004. And I was actually at that Olympic trials as a little kid. And so I got to see that in person. And so that was really cool because that was the first time I felt like, you know, somebody that looked like me went out there and did something that, you know, a lot of people think, you know, can't really be done. And so that was a surreal experience. Um, you know, seeing, seeing the success that Reese, Cam Murphy are having, um, it makes me happy. Uh, I, when I won Pan American Games, I did a clinic in um, Detroit, Michigan, one of the kids at my camp. And um, one of the kids at my camp was Cam Murphy. And so it's crazy. Like, you know, you get to, you really get to see the difference that you make when you do this for long enough. And, um, you know, we, you know, we'll talk back and forth here and there. And I always wish him nothing but the best. You know, it's just trying to be there and support, you know, the next generation. Guys like David Curtis, you know, whenever he blows up, I always shoot him a little message like, you know, keep going, young blood, you know, just keep working, keep working. Mm -hmm. And it's um, it's good to just have that sense of community. Um, and that's something that I feel like in a sport where, you know, black people maybe didn't have, you know, access at the early times. I think back to like my dad, um, my dad was born in 58. And so, um, you know, not to rain on the parade, but um, in the 60s and 70s, you know, pool access was not all that inclusive for people of color. And um, my dad never had that opportunity to do what I did. And so that kind of was something that always really bothered me um, just because I, I really felt like why couldn't someone that I love get to even have that opportunity? And that's kind of, it's sad, but at the same time, the only thing we can do to make it better is just by providing more opportunities for the next generation of kids, um, continue to show them that this is something viable. This is something, yeah, you're not going to be an NBA player or NFL player. You're not going to bag a hundred million dollar contract swimming. I wish you could, but, um, you know, you can go to college, you can go get a college scholarship. You can swim professionally. You can travel the world. You can do all types of things with this that you might not think that you can, and you can come from anywhere. That's the main thing I caught. I always wanted to kind of you know, emphasize with this sport. And at least I feel like my journey kind of emphasizes that, you know, I didn't, I didn't grow up with a silver spoon in my, in my mouth or anything like that. But, um, you know, I had a lot of success in a sport where people think that you have to be from a country club background to do. And uh, if we can just showcase that you don't have to come from that and it is just about how hard you work and your commitment. Um, I think the swimming is going to be a much better place and be much more inclusive and um it'd be great but i th thank you for that that was deep um that's great swimming is not only about the swimmers as well it's about the coaches and and the ad's and the, the usa swimming admin 
You know, we have two great coaches, Division One swimming now, Leah Stance at Tulane and Anthony Nesty at Florida. Uh, so, but but that's still that's two out of 200, 400. Talk about the role models of Jim, you know, Jim Evans, and these, the role models in, in, of coaches and admins who've guided you and we should be aware of. Yeah, guys like Jim Ellis, man. Jim Ellis, um, he coached PDR back in the 80s and 90s. I mean, he had guys swimming at PDR in the 80s and 90s, like winning junior nationals, like a relay of, of four black kids breaking the national age group record. Like, that's crazy for back then. And I feel like we don't give enough credence and, like, really celebrate moments like that. Um, other moments that I think that really stick out to me um, – when Simone, Natalie Hines, and uh, Leah Neal went to three at NCAAs, that was a, a huge moment. I mean, I remember when I looked at that, and I was like, man, like, that's, that's cool. Like, I, there were a lot of NCAAs I went to where it was just like, you know, it'd be me, one other guy, like me, like Dax Hill, and, you know, a couple other guys and stuff like that. But to see a podium at NCAAs and swimming be, you know, three people of color, I mean, that was – it's a really cool moment, and that's something that I think that obviously those three women will, you know, appreciate for the rest of their lives. But it was huge for for people of color in the sport. What do you think needs to happen for pool access? I mean, shoot, COVID's the first time in my life that yeah. I've had any trouble getting access to a pool ever. So, but I mean, I, I could see that that is, you know, uh, uh, prohibitive for, um, you know, for, for certain communities and particularly in uh, communities of color. So has, have you given any thought about that, especially, you know, as you talk about connecting with and inspiring, uh, you know, young people as being one of the, one of the biggest things, most important things for you participating? Like, what do you, what do you think about uh, what the swimming community can do to combat pool access issues? It's a layered issue, but I'd say the beginning of it is learn to swim initiatives. Um, you don't have to be an Olympian. You don't have to be a national champion, but I think swimming is a life skill. and It is something that's necessary, and especially in black and brown communities. Um, you know, swimming rates are very low and the drowning rates are very high. And um, that's that's something simple that we can fix if you actually go out and you show people of color who often – the reason why they don't swim is because of fear. And that fear is, is rooted in a lack of opportunity and a lack of access. If you give more access, that fear will go away and it'll become fun. I mean, that's how I think it, it was for me. Um, neither of my parents were obviously, you know, swimmers. Uh, my mom wasn't a strong swimmer. My dad would tell you himself, you know, he got pulled out of every body of ocean by a lifeguard. So that's where I came from. My parents wanted me to be able to swim and be water safe. So they want it better for their kids. And, uh, you know, that's, that's where it starts. I mean, obviously the Olympics, national teams, all that stuff, that's great. Making college scholarships, that's great too. But if we can just go out and make it fun and show the areas where it actually, I'm talking Detroit, Baltimore, Atlanta's, like places where, you know, a lot of people of color reside and, and show them through swim lessons that this sport is something that they can enjoy. I think that's the start. And whether I've kind of thought about different ways to go about it myself. And um, it, it's a very layered issue. But at the same time, um, it's simple. It's, you know, having relationships with boys and girls clubs and, um, you know, connecting with them, connecting with local YMCAs and things like that. Um, you know, you just you just want to get kids swimming. That's the main thing you want to do. You want to get kids of color in the water. And I think if you do that, you you know, we're not going to be able to change the complete narrative in a year, two years, three years. But if you do that over the course of five, 10, 20 years, you'll have more kids that um, swim and they grow up that love swimming and that will have their kids swim. And it's just a cycle that kind of creates itself and um, it makes it better. It's just, you know, it takes time just like anything. But there are young people out there doing amazing ventures like Jamal Hill and Swim Up Hill. He's, he's striving. Yeah, Jamal Hill does a lot of great work. I mean, he does um, Zoom classes where he, you know, teaches people how to swim and, um, you know, teach them how to hold their breath, even with like little bowls of water, get to get over that fear of like putting your face in the water. Now he's, Jamal's the real deal. And I, I think very highly of him. The work that he does is awesome. Like you said, it's such a, a huge and multi-layered issue. 
Um, yeah. Obviously, you, Jamal, you guys are doing what you can. But should the NGBs, the USA Swimming's, the IOC get more involved with this? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the more help, the better. I think the more access, the more opportunity, the more the more financial backing behind this too, it would really would really help. And I think that eventually, obviously, um, when it comes to America, you know, America might be, I don't know, 17, 16% people of color. I'm not expecting swimming to be that, but if it can be, you know, 3%, 4%, 5%, I mean, like, those are realistic goals. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can do that if we just make it appealing to kids and show kids in areas where, you know, maybe you haven't gone before and you show them that, hey, swimming is something cool that you can do and you can have fun doing this and, and you can take this just as far as you can take basketball or football and things like that. We just don't talk about that as much in our communities because of um, sometimes we have a, a fear of, of trying new things. Mm -hmm. It's a way out for a lot of people from my community, from the Caribbean, to to be able to go to the U.S. and go to school in the U.S. It may not be Division One, Division Two, but they're getting full rides and they're getting education from it. And so they push themselves and their parents push them. And maybe the American culture can see that as well. It, you, it was an opportunity for you to have education, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, I, I'd say I'm one of those kids. I mean, I got an education. I got a scholarship. It changed my life. So um, I can't speak for anyone but myself, but I can definitely say that, you know, if you – take this sport and you take everything that it gives you and the discipline the dedication. It's not just even in this sport, it's in life. It can help you so much. So, I mean, you just, you get used to being committed and you get used to doing things a certain way. And if you do those a certain way in the business world, you'll have success. You are one of the few black swimmers in America now, especially yeah. when you, when you were prime. Um, and that's a, a, to me personally a shame, but what was that like straight up to be a black club swimmer in, ba in Baltimore? Yeah, like like to, to have somebody say no. Imagine have somebody say no, Giles. There's no future for you. Why are you swimming when you're 14 years old? Did that happen to you? Did, what about when you were in college? Would, you it wouldn't be that. that. I don't know. Sorry, you go. go. It, it wouldn't be that direct. I would say maybe you get somebody to be you know, to have the goal to say something like that. But it would be like, hey man, why don't you play basketball? I'm like you don't play football. Like you don't run a track. I feel like you, I get a lot of that, but I, you know, I just hit him with, no, man, like I swim. This is what I really like. And um, it's something that, you know, my very first club team, I didn't go through a culture shock or anything. So I, I my first club team was in Baltimore city. Um, and the, the club was actually, you know, predominantly African-American black people. And so that was my first experience with the USA club team was, was that. So I kind of thought that, you know, swimming at least as a little guy, was just like a representation of America. It wasn't until I got, you know, a little older and I started switching clubs and I, I started noticing like, whoa, you know, I'm one of the few or, you know, I'm the only one. And that kind of, you know, that is hard. I, I will say that, um, especially as being a little kid, um, you know, that, that definitely has its own set of challenges. But um, I had good people, good coaches, good parents and good friends that kind of, you know, if I had moments where, I felt like I was a little lost. They really helped me through that. Hmm. Uh, that Giles, that's key because the amount of stereotypes that yeah. swimmers have faced over the years. Um, I mean, when I, I'm from Trinidad and Tobago, and there's no way a swimmer from Trinidad and Tobago could dream of meddling at the Olympics. There's, you don't. Or there's no way a swimmer could dream of making a national team from, from Baltimore City. There's no way that's going to happen, and you've just done it. So yeah. what... what why is it because of the family and the support and the mindset and you just work did you have to work harder than everybody else in all sorts do you think i would i can't assume you know what anybody else's situation per se but, but you know i know that it was a grind you know it's definitely a grind especially you know being a little kid i can remember just some of the things you, you just go through some of the things that people say um people will devalue sometimes your hard work and just say, oh, you know, he's just, just super talented. So they, like, they don't see that like, mm -hmm. hey, like I'm grinding out five 100s best average kick on a minute 30, like holding minutes. Like they don't see that type of, you know, the grind. And it's not like a black thing or anything. It's, it's the whole thing of our sport. People only see, you know, yeah. the end results of the times and they think, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you, you become who you are from the training, the grind and that commitment. And I think that's the one thing that I kind of um, 
I really got into that when I was a kid, man. Like I had a good coach, Scott Ward, um, the Eagle swim team, man. He just like made it fun to like train hard. And I mean, I like look forward to going to practice like a 14, 15 year old kid, just get my ass kicked doing like 7,500 yard sets, pull sets, you know, just, just really hard stuff. And, um, he always knew I was going to be a sprinter, but he kind of just, um, he made me work for it until probably my senior year. And then I just did power racks and, <laughs> what did he tell you? Did he did he give you examples of people who swam back then? It's like you know, do you know what this person did? He had to do this to get there. What what motivational stuff that he did to you back then to drive you? Or who motivated you? Or how? Um, I could say just some. I mean, when you're younger, you kind of you, you remember all the people that doubted you, and you kind of hold that close to you. And so when I was younger, for sure, I would say doubters or a college that, you know, didn't recruit me or something like that. I always kept those little chips on my shoulder, but you know, now I'm older, I'm at peace, man. I'm, as, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm out here meditating. So I try not to, you know, really, you know, hold, hold anger like that right now. So one thing you mentioned just, you know, that your coach, you know, you look forward to working hard. Was that just you having that, you know, desire for that burn or did they, did the coach do something different to make it more interesting or more fun? Cause you yeah. hear from so many people, Oh, 7,500. That's the last thing they want to do. That's why so many kids quit the sport. Cause it's not fun. It's boring, long sets. What did your coach do to make it fun for you? He really just, he made it so when you come into the pool deck, it's just swimming. There's nothing else. And for me, how I looked at it, I mean, a lot of other kids don't look at it like this way, but I knew from, you know, 12, 13 years old, like if I didn't get a swimming scholarship, you know, I probably wasn't going to go to college or, you know, I would just go to, you know, community college in, in Baltimore, just like, you know, normal situation. Um, but I knew around then that if I just kept grinding, kept grinding, kept grinding, I get college scholarship and then hopefully I could do something with that. And that's kind of um, where, where things went. And, you know, I was really blessed. Um, you know, I went to Tennessee out of high school and, you know, that was cool for a year. And um, I switched it up to U of A um, after that. And that was a, a really good fit for me. And we had a lot of success, but um, I just think that my club coach, um, he just did a really good job of just like relating to me. Like, you know, there weren't many people that I felt like could relate to me in, in terms of coaching, but like we had similar senses of humor. Like that when I was a kid or like 14, 15, my favorite show was, you know, Chappelle's show, Dave Chappelle. And, um, you know, my, co my club coach would always you know, tell me like all the little funny skit stories. <laughs> like, you know, we like, you know, Rick James and all that good stuff. And we, we have fun. I mean, and, and it was just – it was more than swimming. And, you know, I look back in my times with my club coach in high school. I think he's one of the people that, that truly cared about me for the person, not just the swimmer or the points or the talent. Like he just really cared about like Giles, the person and anybody that was like that for me, you know, I'm always going to show love for. Yeah. Yeah. I think we all have those stories of the coach that was just so much fun to be around that that was like the predominant, you know, memory that you have of them. We had a distance coach at Auburn, Ralph Crocker, who passed yeah. while, while, you know, while I was at Auburn. Um, and, uh, you know, the one thing that everybody remembers about him is just how much fun he was to crack jokes with on the pool deck. Right. Like it's like, yeah, yeah there's credentials and everything, but those are the kinds of things you remember. Um, I want to ask you what what do you think that you have? I mean, gosh, how many freaking hundred butterflies have you swam in your life? Like, there's so many hundred butterflies. I don't know. I don't even want to know. It. You've been doing it for so long, and you've been tinkering with this thing for a while, and you've like been knocking on the door of like the A team and you know one Pan Ams and all this. I'm just wondering, like, you know, coming off a Grand Prix win or a Pro Series win, you know, it's pretty good in season. How do you what? Are, what have you learned about uh, how to race the 100 butterfly uh, differently and how has that maybe impacted your training as well? Yeah, um, I would say kind of in the lead up to 20, like so like 2015, how I was swimming it, I was swimming at really high tempo. And so I would be, you know, pretty strong through about like 85 and then you know, if you swim at an elevated tempo, no, tempo, no matter how really efficient you are, eventually you're going to kind of burn. And so I would find that I would, even in races where I have a lot of success, when I went 51 a couple of times, I was just like 
getting mauled alive the last 10, just completely falling apart. And so now I've just tried to really learn how to just be a lot more patient the first 50 and slow my stroke rate down. Um, understand that you don't have to make up all the ground in one stroke. You know, I used to, I think of it this way, like when I was at Pan Ams in 2015, as soon as I came out the turn, I was swinging like everything I had, like off of the turn, which that isn't really the right way to be. You have to think of it as like 75, 85, 95. After about three, four strokes, you build into it. And then that way you can make sure that you close a little better. And um, especially with long course, mm -hmm. um, you've really got to make sure that you are able to put your head down. The one thing that's been really cool about seeing Caleb, and this is something that truly I, I've learned from him, is just um, he can go head down for so long at the end of his races. But I, I saw that and I was just like, man, why did I never do that? Like, what was I thinking? And um, so it's just like little things like that. There's there's so much that you can learn in this sport. Um, people mm -hmm. are starting to see that, um, you know, athletes are in their 30s and swim best times. Like that can happen, especially in the sprints. I don't know about a mile. I mean, a mile will hurt at all. But, you know, 100, <laughs> a 50, things like that, these power races, um, you can swim fast. In your 30s, you know, Tony – winning the gold medal at 36, like anything can kind of happen in those races. As long as you're obviously, you know, you're prepared, you're in shape, you're ready to go. Mm -hmm. So obviously, you know, pacing and having that race strategy sounds like you said, that's a big thing that you're working on. Is yeah. that something that you and the coaches have come up with, or is that something you've kind of figured out on your own? And it sounds like it's kind of a mental shift more than a training shift that has helped with that. Yeah, it's a mental shift and I'm just working with it with coaches and just learning that, hey, like there's certain points where you need to pick to, you know, really focus on in the race. Um, there's certain points that I've kind of realized that a lot of people struggle with. And if you are really good at those points of the race, you're going to swim well. I mean, in the 100 fly long course, it's a lot different than yards. So like yards, um, you can just go out suicide, truthfully. I mean, you can just go out as hard as you want, nail the turns. And even if you like all out die, the last wall, if you can stay down, you know, seven, eight kicks, you're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Where like long course, if you swim like that, like you can, you can get shot with, you can get shot with the tranquilizer. Gun. Meters of pain. <laughs> and you're one arm in and stuff like that. So you just have to understand that um, even if you're swimming, like, I mean, I look at the college swimming right now, like people say like the college times are a little faster than probably when I swam. But the long course times aren't really that much faster, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because everyone's figuring out, hey, yards, I can just go. But then mm -hmm. you can't do that for long course. And so it's it's interesting to see, like, you know, how swimming is kind of changing. But at the same time, I mean, you know, there's some events where it's slower now than it was 10 years ago. Like the 200 free, um, you know, they were swimming way faster 10 years ago. Do yeah. we think yard swimming is – creating this issue a little bit because obviously in theory you say oh yeah 100 fly yards 100 fly long course i need a different race strategy i know that but when we think about it you get on the block it's 100 fly 100 flies in your head if yeah. you do it way more 100 fly yards that might be your default even if you theoretically know the plan accomplishing it is much different yeah i i think that's that's huge. I mean, if you really want to have success in long course, you have to be able to separate how you swim short course and long course. And, you know, if you really want to have success, I mean, pretty much after college short course, I mean, besides doing a couple world cups or a little ISL here and there, or, you know, doing a short course race here and there, you know, short course doesn't really matter. You know, you got to be able to figure out how to swim in the big pool. Yeah. I want to ask you some specifics about training, right? So like yeah. you, I mean, you, you tell me when you moved to Arizona and started training with Bob. When was that? All right. So I've been in Phoenix for forever. I was at Phoenix Swim Club from 2014 to 2016. Then I retired. So that's oh, the team okay. I swam for then. Then I retired and I came back, swam with Phoenix Swim Club till the end of 2019 and then um i was training myself for a little bit and that was kind of interesting um and then i i swam isl and rachel stratton mills was one of the coaches yeah. and um you know she connected me with bob and um you know that was probably one of the best things i think that probably happened to me for long course is just um i went from you know super sprint program to you know i mean i'm swimming 
And like, it's me, Allison and like Haley Flickinger. And I mean, like I'm swimming, like I was like 16 years old Jeez. and like I'm getting torched at some of these practices, but it's good for me just because, you know, I felt like, especially with swimming, you have to put yourself in that uncomfortable position, at least in some point, you know, you might not have to live in it for three, four years, but you know, when it's about 18 months out, you want to be uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, you don't want to be comfortable um, when it comes to that. So just thinking about it, things like that. And um, when it comes to training philosophies, obviously weight training is huge. Diet's huge. When I was younger, man, um, my diet was terrible, man. I was eating Chick-fil-A, McDonald's, Burger King, Popeye's, all that good stuff. But when I, you know, got older and um, started just mature a little bit, I was like, hey, man, like, why am I eating like this? Like, I'm eating like a, like a 16 year old and I'm like, I'm a professional athlete. Like I got to, you know, raise that. And then the performances started to get better as you know, I left college and um, became a little, a little bit more of a professional. Did you learn that on your own? Or you have help nutritionists and stuff, you own research, you worked with Bob. Where did you Both. Um, I work with a nutritionist. Um, I've done a lot of research myself, kind of figured out some things that work for me. Um, found out I was allergic to peanuts, like when I was like 24 years old. Yeah. <laughs> so I've been like going to meets and I, I found out that like, you know, I'm allergic to peanuts and I can think back to like taper meats I was at. And I was just like, holy sh crap, I'm like eating peanut butter, <laughs> like yeah. literally at a taper meat. And like, that's, I don't like break out like anaphylactically, but my, in, you know, my insides, you know, they have an allergic reaction. So it's not good to be in that spot, you know, when you're at a table meet. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned meditation and, and this maturity and stuff. How have you changed your whole mental approach to your training, your racing, your lifestyle as well? Do you do, Tom Shields talks about being deliberate about having these steps he does every day just to focus on the positive and the good things. And it's really remarkably changed the swimming as we all see. Have you worked, have you, talk about that whole aspect that we don't, we don't often talk about. Well, the first thing is just having some sense of like routine, you know, you have to have some sense of a basic routine, you know, whether it's a day when you're training in the morning or not. Um, you know, when I have morning practice, I, I try to wake up, I try to make sure I'm, I'm mobile. I do a little bit of, um, I get the hypervolt, you know, yeah. this guy. Mm -hmm. yeah, I love it. Yeah. And um, just make sure that I'm loose. Like when I was younger, I could get away with just so much like, you know, I wasn't rolling out and like not worried about flexibility and all that stuff where it's just as at this stage, I feel like I have to do so many little things, but they do add up and make a little difference. Um, meditation is, is really big and deep breathing, especially at these big meets. Cause you know, I mean, with swimming, it's a lot of stress. You go to these big meets, you know, you got to shave your body or in all in front of all these people, there's lights, there's cameras, there's a lot of just like outside distractions. Mm -hmm. So you have to just be able to kind of just, I, I like to say, like, you know, just getting away and just being able to find a quiet place, you know, put your headphones on and just focus on your breathing. Um, when I found that I've struggled in braces, it's been because I could not, you know, center back in where I feel like a lot of the races where I've had a lot of success, you know, I'm just, you know, there, I'm not thinking too much. I'm just going out there, I'm executing and I might go up to the block with like maybe one key thing that I'm thinking about, like, all right, like nail this turn and hit off the turn of a hundred fly 13 dolphin or something like that. It'll be like one necessary skill where I'm not like, all right, break out here, do this here, like pick up a 35 where sometimes if you overthink too much, um, you struggle. And another thing too, which I think is um, really interesting. I, I talk to this with kids a lot too. And uh, whenever a race goes at live speed, like when it's, let's say a 22 second race and it feels like it's 22 seconds to you, you usually swim pretty slow. But whenever it's like a 22 second race and it feels like it's like a minute, you're going fast <laughs> and you feel every single stroke and you're connected and you feel like you're going in slow motion like those are the best ones there was an article or a story about lomelo ball he arrived to the game didn't warm up just started the game for the hornets and he had his best like three-point shooting he just like just started shooting he had no warm-up he didn't think about it he just started playing ball and he had he's bringing the fun back in basketball 
And a lot of our previous guests have talked about that. I'll just talk about, you know, Cody Miller talks about getting on the blocks, being in the finals of the 100 breasts and just remembering why he's there and having fun and what he went in bronze, right? Um, yeah. Do you do you and Bob talk um, work on that? Work on preparing to, to do that? Or are you working yourself or you work with him? I mean, I think for me, it's just like I kind of work on that, you know, that the fun element that's more in my control because, you know, I dictate kind of you know, what is fun and, and what isn't. So I think that for me, like, I just try to look at it as, hey, man, like, every chance I get out here to swim is an opportunity to get better. I'm jealous. Yeah. If I don't take that chance, like, you know, that's on me. But, you know, the cool thing about doing this when you want to do it, it's like, if you don't want to go to practice, that's on you. But if the results don't show up how you want to, like, don't complain. Like, it's it's just a different stage of, of life. I mean, I feel like you don't need someone to, necessarily hold your hand as much at this stage where you know you just have to take a lot of ownership and responsibility for your own swimming do you like this style of training though or is this adult wise this is what i need giles talking who's saying hey let me try something different because i haven't gone this path before so i'm going to try the the bob approach and the yardage approach like i'm a 16 year old and see how this turns out i mean do you enjoy it yeah, no, I, I for sure enjoy it. It's, it's great training. Um, right now, I'm actually, I kind of made, recently I made a switch um, with um, my training. I'm actually training with Amy Bilquist and um, Kevin and Bob, actually, at Scottsdale. So yeah. it's kind of yeah. getting back to a little bit more cool. of that sprinty power, ripping 50s, 75s, a ton of kicking. But that year that I spent with Bob, is, I, I think it was invaluable. I mean, for me, it just like, I mean, especially because I took all that time off, I felt like it just got my fitness back, which I, I felt like when I came back, I almost like never really got all my fitness back. Where with Bob, I felt like, oh, man, like maybe uh, I felt like I'm 22 again. Were there some elements from that training that now you're going, OK, I, I've been away from it for so long, but now I know that there's a foundation there that's helpful for me. Are you guys like kind of are you incorporating any of those ideas now? I mean, obviously, your yeah. career is always a conglomerate of like, you know, continuation of what you've done before in your previous experiences. But is there anything specific that you're going, OK, I'm going to hold on to that for sure. Um, stroke length. I mean, just really obsessing over the amount of strokes you're taking in long course laps and mm. being able to kind of be able to push your head forward into your stroke. There's some things that I learned from Bob and just like from how he worked with Michael. And um, I mean, it, it was really good tips in terms of just how to be flatter in the water, um, just learning just how to move in different ways where I had really never thought of that. So I think um, the stroke length things are huge. And um, for me, just like knowing that, hey man, like, I'm going to come to this practice and either this practice is going to win or I'm going to win the mentality. And I mean, that's how those workouts are. And either you come out on the other side or the practice wins. So it's just like um, going in there and just laying it out there. I mean, I think that's the number one thing that I love about this sport is that um, you don't get that really anywhere else. That feeling of just like, Hey man, I gave this everything I had and like, I couldn't do anything more and whatever the results are, they are. How do you describe your butterfly drills? Um, Kavik talks about he really focused on landing his hand and and swimming past where his hand landed. You know, um, Michael talks about being flat and forward. How do you see your ideal butterfly when you're on? This is Giles Smith was this kind of butterfly. Rhythmic. I think that for me, it's all rhythm. And when my rhythm starts to break, um, I get into big trouble. So mm -hmm. it's just, I, and how I swim long course is I go two up, one down. Yep. And so I always, I, for me, when I'm swimming really well, I almost feel like I'm swimming at like, you know, kind of like a metronome. So it's like up, up, down, up, up, down, up, up, down. And if you're just like in that rhythm, it makes it a lot more flowy. Um, another thing with my stroke, um, so it's very kick driven. I would say that I'm a lot better at my kick than even I am with my arms. One weakness I would say with my stroke is that um, when I get up here, sometimes I have trouble bringing the head down as the shoulders come across. Sometimes I like to get the head up all the way through. And um, that's one thing that I've just really been trying to fix. But, um, you know, I'd say the main thing with my stroke, especially in long course, is just trying to be rhythmic 
and um, and smooth and flowy. I, I want it to look effortless. It's not effortless. Yeah, we know we survive. <laughs> get, I've had some hundred flies, man, but I've been throwing up my lunch <laughs> after, like hard. I, I did an ISL race the first season, the very first race, hundred fly, short meters. I got like third. Fine. Everyone's like, oh wow, Josh could swim. Immediately after. <laughs> but everyone, like in the warm down pool, man, like it was super embarrassing. All these good swimmers just looking at me. Oh my God, that guy. That was yeah. my last race ever, 100 fly long course. I was like, We're done. We're done. Like, yeah. man, look all that Chick fil A in there. That that explains it. I mean, I haven't eaten Chick fil A in five years. <laughs> so you mentioned the rhythmic nature of, of the breathing pattern. Yeah. Earlier, you talked about maybe learning from Caleb to keep that head down at the end. How are you going to be implementing that uh, strategy? Um, in the long course race, I think of it as like, you know, you're building that whole second 50. And then once you get to about, I mean, for him, I mean, I think he goes maybe 17, 15 meters. I mean, I try to do it maybe the last five strokes, mm -hmm. you know, once I'm about four or five strokes out, I start thinking, all right, Get the head square and down. And I actually try to get my stroke a little bigger than it actually is. So I try to deepen my catch and oh, slow yeah. it down even more and um and deepen my kick a little bit more for those last four or five strokes and just try to stay as flat on the surface with my core as I can. That's what I'm really thinking of the last little bit. And then the last stroke, man, I'm just like, give me to this wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I haven't heard anyone talk about, but talking with you, thinking it through, you have yeah. Gary Hall, Race Club, um, Nathan that do the three styles of freestyle. And at the end of the race, Nathan changes his stroke a little bit. I mean, it sounds like you're kind of altering your fly stroke a little bit at the end. Are we starting to have this kind of evolution where, OK, certain muscle groups are completely trashed? Let's get the head down, be obviously in a more streamlined position, but maybe call on some different muscle groups to get you to the wall. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that it can, you can use your lats a little bit more when you swim in that type of way. It's, I mean, you're pretty much selling out when you're doing that. I mean, like yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm giving it everything I have to empty the tank, but I'm going head down hypoxic and I'm just deepening my kick. So that way I feel like it will slow down my stroke just a touch more. And I mm -hmm. think that it's, it's easier to time your finishes if your stroke rate slows down a touch, not like a lot, but if your stroke rate slows down a little bit, it gets a lot easier to kind of time your finishes. Oh, I want to talk to you about warm up. So how, like, so is there something you do differently warming up for a hundred butterfly than other events? And if so, like, what is your race warm up? Yeah. So I keep it the same pretty much with every race I do. The only thing that changes is like maybe the pace at the end. So like I'll do the pace, the specific stroke that I'm racing. Uh -huh. So um, how I do it is I do a 400 swim, a 200 kick, a 200 pull, uh, 15, no breath, 25, no breath, 35, no breath, 50, no breath. Then I do two 25s, one strong freestyle, then one stronger freestyle. And then I do usually two setup 25s fly, one just super long distance per stroke, four or five, and then one faster. And then usually so, uh, I'm ready to go. So everything before the fly was freestyle, including the no breath? Yes. Okay. But Maybe. I mean, when I'm, when I'm warming up, I'm, you know, I'm messing around with my underwaters on turns uh -huh. and things like that. Um, I'm playing around with a couple little things in my stroke, but I try not to. I like to do all my flying training. You know, if I'm really tinkering too much with my stroke at the meet, I find that I, I kind of struggle a little bit more. Fly is, is unique to where, like, if your fly is on, your fly is on. Like, I've had races where I did a World Cup in Dubai where I missed a, a bus ride to finals because I was sleeping. And I was just taking a nap, and I missed the bus ride. And um, I was just like, oh, crap. Well, I'm not going to get to warm up. So there was a pool party at this pool in Dubai. Literally, guys, like, drinking yeah. beers and, like, pool partying it up. Like, for real. Like, in Dubai, they were living. And so I get in there, my little speedo. I just do some sculling. Oh, that's part of the show. <laughs> a little bit of sculling, a little bit of like just head down, just like a couple strokes. I probably swam a total of like 300, maybe. And I like sprinted to the pool, threw on my suit, and um, <laughs> I swam fast, man. I got silver. I was like right behind Chad LaClaw, only like 23-4, the 50 fly in the jammer. So, I mean, it was good. I was happy with that. 
<laughs> then you're like, Chad, I got this sweet after party. We're going to head to. <laughs> I got the men's. <laughs> but um, no, it was, um, hey, you got to make do with what you can. And I think that like sometimes we, with one thing COVID has kind of shown people, you know, at least with training, is that sometimes you can do a little less and some real fast. Not saying like you can't like, you know, miss a bunch of practices and not train, but like you can, you don't have to grind out, you know, 10 practices doing 9,000 yards every single day and to be a world-class swimmer, especially in sprinting. Like people are starting to really see that. No, we, we had a few conversations recently. The young kid, David Curtis, he only does 25s to warm up and he, I can go and rest the 21 8 long course. Uh, Arto Boulder and Gary Hall Jr. Gary would just do a dive and, like, I'm good. I'm done. One dive. Or Arto would say his athletes just do a couple starts, do a couple head downs. I'm like, we're ready. It's it's really whole, I don't know. It, I guess at the end of the day, you got to be comfortable with that as well, right, Giles? You got to be sure that, like, that 25 was good for me. And I'm not going to, like, have any doubts on block and not warmed up enough because that's the, that's the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, I've played around with some of those short warm-ups, too. Um, there was one the NCAAs or Pac-12s, I don't remember. I was swimming the two medley relay, and I did, like, a 200 smooth. And uh, my coach was Rick DeMont at the time. He's um, he's yeah. awesome. He's probably one of the best coaches out there in the world. Um, and he had me do – well, I'll do it in his voice. So let me put it all together. Yeah, Giles. All right. Looking good. Cool. How about you do a 25 as slow as you possibly can underwater? Take 40, 50 seconds. The slower you go, probably the faster you go. I did it. <laughs> Went like 50 seconds. And I was like, all right. And he was like, was that a good underwater adventure? And I'm like, yeah, it was. And he, and he was just like, you feel ready to go? And I was like, yeah, I do. <laughs> and so I got out. <laughs> and I threw on my suit. And um, I put on my jammer. And we swam to my relay. I swam like lights out and it was it was cool you know there's there's so many different ways to swim fast especially short course yards like you know short course short course yards is even more so than short course meters you can get away with i think short course yards you can get away with anything <laughs> yeah i mean i think a warm-up <laughs> is such an interesting thing and i think yeah. thing, obviously it's what you kind of grow up with what the old um, kind of old old philosophy that you've used and what has, like Luke said, you got to be comfortable with it. And we kind of go back to what we learned growing up and obviously what's been passed along. Oh, you need to do this amount of yardage, this amount of yardage. But at some point it is a feeling and it's, you know, physiologically you're warmed up, you're, you know, your body temperature gets to a certain level, you're warmed up. Psychologically, you're mentally ready. You are confident you can do it. What else is there that needs to be done? Nothing. Just believe when you stand up on that block. That's the number one thing is just believe when you stand up on that block. That and an underwater adventure. And you're good to go. <laughs> it may be a couple. The I'm longer the better. <laughs> I'm so glad we began to speak to you because we, 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 we've been wanting to speak to you ever since we spoke to all the DC Trident coaches, GMs before um, ISL. And so we we're so excited to see your race. And then we didn't see much of you. You guys and- did not. I got yeah, terribly. I, I got sick when I was out there. <laughs> but you're a captain. DC Challenge swam out of their mind, so you had a huge part to deal with that. So go yeah, ahead. it was it was good, but it was. I mean, at least the second year is definitely super frustrating. I mean, I never had went to a international meet in my entire career where I got sick, and so especially with COVID and everything, like I was literally quarantined to my room for five days. Um, I did not touch a pool. Um, I did a couple of push-ups in my room and basically slept on and off like 12 hours a day, like every day. And so my first meet where I swam, I, I swam pretty rough, actually. The very first meet I swam, it was first meet in seven months. I think I had a little bit of rust. And I swam one day of the second meet and then got really sick, missed the third meet, didn't swim for five days. And then the fourth meet, I just swam one relay. And of course, because I was doing underwater adventures and having fun, I swam the best I swam the whole time after not touching the water for five days. You know, I bla- I was, it's, it's just how it is. You know, sometimes you just need a little bit of rest and um, you need to chill. But the fourth meet I swam well, I just swam a, a relay, but I think I was like 50.2 on the 100 fly there. So that was a lot better. I mean, I was going like 51, like six or seven. I was swimming pretty, pretty rough for the first beginning. But I mean, by the end of that, I felt like I was ready to go, but I, I was ready to go when it was like, you know, the plane bus, the plane ride was the next day. 
Well, Giles, in the ISL, every year is a contract year, and you, in a contract year, didn't really step up. So what does that mean for your status for next season? I don't know. You know, we'll just see. I mean, for me, I'm looking, um, you know, at this stage of my career, I take it, you know, season by season. Right now, I'm just all in for trials. And, you know, after that, I'll kind of evaluate where I'm at and decide, you know, if I'm going to continue or if I'm going to retire. You know, I, I can – I'm mature enough to say that at this stage. Um uh, I mean, I can just look at things and just analyze it and, and see if I'm where I want to be and I want to call it a career great. If I don't, I, hey, man, I'll, I'll keep swimming. I can keep doing it. Mm-hmm. Where are you at for trials qualifications? You're wave one? You're yeah. Okay? Yeah, yeah. How, how are you feeling for that? How are you feeling? How are you planning for that June 17th stuff? I mean, I mean, get some unknowns, but where are you at for that? What's going on? Getting, getting there for sure. Um, It's definitely a lot of unknowns. I mean, I'd say that this is probably the least that, you know, athletes have really raced in an Olympic trials year ever. I mean, if you really think about it, like even if you do every pro series meet, what there's three pro series meets and then trials. I mean, that's not much. I mean, I've swam years where you get to swim 12, 13 meets before trials. So you really just have to take advantage of every time that you race. So for me at San Antonio, I mean, I, I'd like to swim pretty well. I mean, I'm not going to shave or anything, but I, I'd like to swim pretty well and use that as momentum. Um, you just try to get faster each meet and just try to get better at those skills. So then when you get to trials, um, you know, you have your plans 100% how you want to execute them. It's just a matter of actually executing under the stress of trials. That's it. To, to, to talk about trials, because you told in a previous talk about your first trials and you were really, your whole family had made plans to go to trials and you didn't get to make it. And it was really disappointing yet really motivating for you, right? You hope, yeah. And then what happened in 12, you had a good trials, but you want to do better. How are you going to approach trials given those disappointments and hard work you put in? How are you approaching trials now given you're 29 years old? Um, I would say that I just take it. I would say when I was younger, I'd always look forward so much. I'm like, oh, this date, this date, this date. And I wasn't just focused on the day where I was at. And I think in 2016, that really kind of screwed me up. I was always looking forward. Um, And I really never took advantage of every day where this is just like, I'm like, all right, like it's February 11th. What am I going to do to get better for this meet? Like what? And that's how I kind of look at things. And I think of swimming is in like little three week sections. So, Basically, you can improve in swimming if you have a good three weeks of training. I think of it like that. So if you put together a good three-week block, another three-week block, another three-week block. So I'm looking at it right now. I mean, there's still a good amount of time to work. I mean, yeah, you're going to need to rest for a little bit. But, I mean, at the earliest, you rest at the end of May. So, I mean, you have between from now until the end of May to really get a lot of work. It's a lot of time. And um, a lot of people, I think sometimes they make it bigger than it is. You know, like, oh, this is the trials year. Well, if you've been in the this is the trials year attitude since last year this time and you never really just like let yourself get out of it. You've been in the trials meet attitude for like a year and nine months. Like that's a lot. And I feel like that's really hard to maintain for like periods of time like that. Like, yeah, you can maintain it for six months or maybe nine months of I'm talking like all in. But maintaining that for four years three years two years i think that it's very difficult and i've i mean i've talked with other you know really you know other olympians even about that and they're like no like you have to have a time where you're like all right this is like crime what 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 if trials got canceled would you keep swimming right now (sighs) i have to decide i just really have to look back and see how i'd swim obviously i'd like to see how if trials got canceled, I mean, I would like to see how I, I swim this season. Yeah. You know, hopefully I get a chance to shave, taper, swim fast. And then I just evaluate. But, I mean, do I think I would go another three, four years? Probably not. I mean, I'm, I'm being honest. But maybe I'd go another year or another year and a half or something like that. If I'm really enjoying it and I'm swimming fast, I mean, why not? I mean, I, I enjoy it. I love it. And it's something that keeps me fit. It keeps me disciplined. I mean, I think it makes me better at my job as well. Is that what drives you, though? The trials, the Olympic cycle, or the love of swimming and the ISL opportunities? What if there's no more Olympics and you only had ISL every year? Well, it'd be, it'd be pretty cool um, as well. I think the, the Olympics is what I've always wanted, though. I mean, truthfully, that's that's why I'm here. 
Like I'm not here because I saw so I'm here because I want to swim fast long course. And um, that is the number one thing that motivates me in my career. I am. Um, when I was, you know, like 18 or 19, I wrote all these goals down um, after my year at Tennessee and um, in swimming. And these were at the time, these were out there goals. I mean, this was like break American records, win international medals, win USA swimming, like national championships. And um, I've done every single thing that I put down on that crazy goal sheet. And the very last thing is to make the Olympic team. So it would be nice if I can just cross that out and I can take that goal sheet. <laughs> But um, that's the last step, I think, for me. And if it happens, great. If it doesn't happen, that doesn't define me. I mean, I've had a great career. I've been able to make an impact with kids, been able to, um, you know, win major meets. And um, I've loved it. So, I mean, I have no regrets with my career. I think that my career has went, you know, yeah, we all won a couple of races back. But at the same time, it's like, for the most part, my career has been interesting. Charles, we got some rapid fire questions for you to close. Yeah. What's the hardest race in swimming? 200 back. Long course or short course? It does some short course ones. They're pretty, back when I was a kid, I race to tear you up. 400 IM is really difficult too, but 200 back, I think it's still sprinty enough where you can kick a ton, like almost the whole race. 200 mm -hmm. back, oh my God, that would have fried me. Absolutely yeah. brutal. Olympic gold or world record? Olympic gold. If you could start an ISL team, what would you call it? The DC Trident. Oh, <laughs> you, know, you know I had to give you, know I had to give you all that one. Come on. <laughs> Oh no, you wouldn't. Are you like uh, Joss Smith, real reality, <laughs> something like that? <laughs> Are you the fastest Giles of all time? Hope so. If there's another dude named Giles, man, let's have a race. <laughs> or, or or a lady, who knows? Hey, yeah, bro. you never know these days. <laughs> all right, this is our, this is our 75th show. If really? there was, if there was a 75 butterfly, who would be the, who would be your top three fastest in the world? 75 butterfly. 75. Long or short? Long. Caleb still. Duh. Uh, I gotta really think about this. Maybe someone like um, the Hungarian guy is really good. Sebastian Zabo, he's really good. Yeah, all right. That would be a guy in the seventy-five. I think he'd be better in the seventy-five. Than he would be a hundred. Uh -huh. um, let me think. One more person. I'll go foreigners. I think it's more fun to kind of you know everybody knows who the Americans are. Uh, maybe the, the the other Hungarian guy, Christoph Milat. Oh, to 75. Shoot. Guy can swim. <laughs> well, take a note that Giles Smith wasn't in that top three. Come I'm on. I'm going to include myself, man. <laughs> Come on. All right. Uh, how how long of a long course fly set can you hold off Hallie Flickinger? So if we do, if we do 50s, I, I'm good. If we do 50s fast on some long rests, I'm good. The minute it goes over that, we start doing some hundreds. Not, and I'm not talking like one, two, maybe even three. I'm talking like we're doing like, it's like five, six, one hundreds. I'm toast, man. She can just keep going and just keep going and just keep going. She just doesn't hurt, and I'm in the gutter, just like praying for my survival. <laughs> How many more houses will you close in 2022 if you make the Olympic team? <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I set a I set a goal out there. I mean, I, I, maybe twenty thirty would be amazing. I think that would be out there incredible for for this year. Sick. Uh, what's the time that it's going to take to make the Olympic team in the hundred fly? Well, there's going to be Caleb who's going to be a body lift in front of everybody, and then there's going to be everybody else that's trying to fight. I think fit. I think if you go fifty at that moment, at that time mm -hmm. in the final, I think you go. I think you'll make it. anything under 51. Just saying. Anything. I think pretty much anything under 51. So you'd be surprised. Everyone thinks these big time hundred flies, the times are going to be crazy. If you look at 2016 Olympics, um, times weren't that crazy. Um, and a lot of these big races with fly, I think, especially, it's, especially the 50 fly too. Obviously this is a hundred, but 
the 50 yeah. fly you get these guys and they put so much waves and they're just like mauling each other if you have you've noticed that too like a lot of times right. those big 50 fly heats they swim slower than they do yeah. at a semi yeah i think that, it, that might happen i i well we say 50.7 to be safe probably but i think if you you crack 51 and you really crack it you're gonna go to tokyo if it happens hmm. Charles, thanks for hanging out with us. I got, I got one question. I got one question. What you got? You talk about b- butterflies, one of the most beautiful strokes to watch. I love seeing a good butterfly. You talk about yourself. Who is who to you the most beautiful butterfly swimmer ever? Ever? You're talking about Michael Gross, Beyondy, Nasty, Dressel. You're talking right up. Who's the most beautiful? You see him. Just flows. I got to think about it a little bit more. Just give me a second. It's Phelps, for sure. The yeah. effortless, the, this, his stroke is so effortless. And that's the thing that's, you can be in front of Michael the first the first 50. You can be in front of Michael the first 75. But you're not going to be in front of Michael at the 100. That's just oh. how it is. I mean, and it's just because for him, he's going out the first 50, you know, at 60% when everybody else is going out at like 85. And then yeah. he's able to pick it up and go to his 95 where – Everybody else has hit 95, probably at 75 meters, where he's at 75 and he's like, oh, I've been swimming at 85. And then like he goes up another gear the last 25, which because he, he has so much relaxation in his stroke, for sure, Michael. I mean, I, I think that he has the cleanest stroke um, without a doubt. Agreed. That's it for this episode of the Social Kick Podcast. Thanks for hanging out. We'll see you next time. Cool. Thank you guys for having me. Hey everybody, thanks for hanging out with us. If you're enjoying Social Kick, tell your friends about it. And be sure to tell us what you liked by leaving a comment. And subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at the Social Kick Podcast. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Social Kick. And you can find all of our content on our website at thesocialkick.com.